It's an age-old problem. You're standing in front of your closet trying to decide what to put on your feet before rushing out the door. Chances are you'll reach for a well-worn pair of Vans or Converse and leave without giving your footwear a second thought. That is, if you're not a sneakerhead. are so common that we rarely pause to think about the past or future of the shoes that carry us through our daily lives. The steadfast and humble sneaker has developed into a niche yet profitable collector's market dominated by celebrity endorsements and huge brand names. But to know how it all began, we'll have to travel back a few hundred years. The earliest conception of the modern-day sneaker was developed in the 1830s by the Liverpool Rubber Company, and they were called plimsolls. The shoes were mostly worn by the upper classes, who had time for leisure activities such as sailing and tennis. But soon, the shoes became more common as their grippy soles proved useful for sports. The first shoe designed specifically for running hit the market in 1895. The term plimsolls was traded for sneakers when the U.S. rubber company started manufacturing shoes in America. At the beginning of the sneakers' life, they were solely used for sports, mainly track and field. About a hundred years later, sneakers were now part of people's everyday wardrobe. Sneakers started outperforming dress shoes in sales, and this trend continued into the modern day. Now, sneakers from big brands such as Adidas and Nike can be found on the feet of everyone, even if you can't afford your own sailboat. Although if you're eyeing a rare pair of Nike Air Max 90s or Jordans, you might need to take out a loan. Now, we know Converse as the go-to sneaker that can complete any outfit. But until the 80s, Converse All-Stars, endorsed by Chuck Taylor, were THE shoe for basketball. However, up-and-coming brands such as Nike and Adidas developed innovative sports technology that outperformed Converse on the court. These brands literally changed the game of basketball, benching Converse. But that was far from the end for Converse. They became part of the uniform for punk rockers like the Sex Pistols and 90s grunge bands such as Nirvana. When it comes to an all-around sneaker, Converse are probably the most popular shoe of all time. Which is crazy to think about considering they've been around for what seems like forever. So in the 80s, Nike swooped in on Converse to dominate the sports market. They envisioned big things for their brand, and an endorsement deal with Michael Jordan took them to the next level. Today, Michael Jordan is recognized as the most famous basketball player of all time, thanks, in part, to his deal with Nike. To play basketball in a pair of Air Jordans in the 80s was to align yourself with Jordan's on-court magic. Aspiring basketball players aimed to emulate the Jumpman logo used to market the shoe, a silhouette of Jordan in mid-flight about to make a slam dunk. Nowadays, younger people gravitate towards Jordans because of the iconography of the design. And for the people who grew up and witnessed the Jordan era, the shoe now represents an opportunity to be part of Jordan's lasting legacy. The lore and prestige surrounding Nike's Jordan sneakers is enough to carry the brand onward into the modern day and beyond. Shoe brands are constantly on the lookout for the next star to partner with, but it seems like no one can do it quite like Mike. Other companies have their own version of the Air Jordan success story. Adidas made the first ever leather tennis shoe endorsed by Stan Smith, an American tennis player. The sleek white design with pops of green on the heel and tongue is timeless. Today, the shoe was worn by a laid-back and casual crowd. But in the 80s, the shoe was associated with country clubs and tennis courts and had more of a preppy vibe. Stan Smith's continued to be successful until 2011 when Adidas surprised everyone. They stopped producing the shoe despite its enduring popularity. But some will say this was a publicity stunt to create more hype. In 2014, they re-released the shoe and were met with record-breaking sales because of endorsement deals with celebrities such as Pharrell. Today, collectors are more interested in vintage versions of this shoe from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Anything with Stan's green, smiling endorsement logo is a hot ticket in the sneaker world. 
In terms of street style, though, nothing beats the Nike Air Max 90s designed by Tinker Hatfield in 2000. 20 years later, this shoe is still one of Nike's best-selling silhouettes. Hatfield's iconic design highlighted the technology that made the sneaker work by exposing the air pocket in the side of the shoe. His innovation elevated the sneaker to a status that even made heads in the world of high fashion turn. One of the most sought after and expensive iterations of this model is Bacon by Dave Ortiz, who ran a sneaker boutique called Dave's Quality Meats. Also, a legendary grime pioneer Dizzy Rascal collaborated on this model to create Tongue and Cheek, meant to promote his album by the same name. With the Air Max 90, Nike created the classy, casual style a lot of sneaker brands now try to emulate. Plus, sneakerheads the world over yearn to get their hands on rare versions of this shoe. These are a far cry from the first Nike shoes running around schoolyards in the early 80s. It's crazy to think about how all these brands have their own unique styles and designs. But you're probably wondering, how did sneaker culture even begin? It seems so easy to just order a new pair of shoes online. So how did sneakers gain such a following? Well, urban youths living in New York City during the 80s and 90s were the first to truly appreciate sneakers. Back then, footwear was the most important part of any outfit. A rare sneaker in pristine condition let people know you had good taste and could afford expensive things. The popularity of hip-hop music also influenced sneaker culture. Songs like My Adidas by Run DMC and My Air Force Ones by Nelly hyped up certain shoes, causing people to want them even more. Footwear aficionados amassed every shoe that was released, and pretty soon, a collector's market was born. Back then, the sneaker community was an underground network of enthusiasts whose hobby was the pursuit of rare shoes. You had to know store owners and other collectors to find out when drops were happening, or else you were out of the loop and out of luck. People used to line up outside actual stores for days just to get the latest kicks. Now the community has moved online and is accessible to anyone with an internet connection. People buy rare shoes as investment pieces or compete in fierce bidding wars on sites like eBay for vintage styles. Also, brands now advertise their drops across social media platforms. But what has continued to fuel sneaker culture is nostalgia. People yearn for the shoes they wanted as kids but couldn't afford. Now, all grown up, they might have the means to fulfill that childhood wish. For this reason, retro styles will never go out of fashion. People want the shoes that will make them feel young again. But when holding the shoebox in your hands, not everyone is brave enough to actually wear them. To wear or not to wear, that is the question. Some seasoned sneakerheads say the only true way to appreciate a shoe is to wear it out and about. To keep your shoes on a shelf as a trophy is just crazy. What's the point of having the goods if you can't show them off, right? However, sneaker purists, usually new to the game, will scoff at this. They are willing to buy shoes that don't fit or that they know they'll never wear just to expand their collection. But whichever side of the fence you're on, both sides agree that a good sneaker is a work of art. While some revel in the pure joy of wearing art on their feet, others want to preserve the shoes for posterity. For those who grew up thinking sneakers were just another regular pair of shoes, to wear around, the idea of collecting them still seems a little strange. It's safe to say that the sneaker craze is here to stay. So what do sneaker heads have to look forward to? In terms of sustainability, there have been some ideas in the sneaker world about creating a closed loop production circuit. A what, you ask? Well, only the material from old, recycled sneakers would be used to create new ones. That's really taking retro to the next level. Many designers continue to experiment with biodegradable fabrics or 3D printing technology to lessen waste. A smaller ecological footprint seems to be the next biggest footwear trend. Also, in 2011, Nike dropped a replica of a shoe featured in Back to the Future 2 called the Nike Mag. 
only 1,500 pairs were released, with all of the proceeds going to the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease. The shoe is wildly expensive and rare, but the self-lacing technology is groundbreaking for people with limited mobility. And just basically pretty cool all around. And you thought the Reebok pump was revolutionary. So next time you're standing in front of your closet deciding what to wear, you might want to give your sneakers a second thought. Will you rock something retro, or are you into a more futuristic look? Either way, what you wear on your feet says a lot about you, especially to a sneakerhead. Thanks for watching. We truly appreciate it. Tap or click another great video, hit that subscribe button, and ring that notification bell.